everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Kirsten and I'm also an audiovisual artist under the name Naoki and I've recently written this book. It's called Performing Electronic Music Live. It smells like a new book. Yeah, I can't believe I did that to be honest. Anyway, in this video I thought I would summarise my whole book in one video. I don't know how I'm going to get on with that because it's got... I actually know how many pages my book's got. 200 and... 75 uh, but yeah i'm going to try and summarize my book in this video and see how i get along uh, so first of all what the hell is my book about i mean the title kind of says it all it's about how we can perform electronic music live uh, and basically, if you are a producer like me and you love to produce music uh, in the box kind of thing, you know, in a DAW, you might have come across the difficulty of not quite knowing how you can perform this live. Uh, so, of course, electronic music is great. Um, obviously, it sounds great, but it's also great in the sense that you can play loads and loads of instruments all at the same time. You basically can create a whole arrangement just by yourself, which is uh, one of the reasons why I love it so much. Uh, but obviously you can't really do that life and on the fly. So uh, that's where things get a little bit tricky. Uh, and so I thought I'd break down a lot of different setups in my book about how you can perform electronic music live. So obviously one thing that you could do is you could just produce your song and then export it as a backing track and then play it out loud and sit on a chair and listen to it play but it wouldn't be the most engaging performance. Similarly, you can sing to a backing track, which can be cool, but normally it's even cooler if there's some other kind of interesting stuff going on on stage. So basically, that's what I was trying to do in this book. I actually broke down 12 different performance setups that are all completely different. And I made this great big tutorial series here on YouTube and uh, I'll link it down below so you can check it out. I will also obviously link the book down below as well. Uh, if you want to read it you know it would be great so in this video i'm going to try and give you an overview over all the different setups and just kind of talk about i guess the anatomy of a electronic music performance setup so needless to say performance styles and electronic music are super diverse there's lots of different things you can do uh, some people dj some people work with daws and controllers some people incorporate acoustic instruments and so on uh, so there's a lot of different things that you can do and i think it's important to bear in mind that what works for you might not work for the next person so what works in a live show really depends on your music genre your skills your talents what you actually find fun also who actually is in your audience because if you're fiddling with all these exciting and interesting buttons and you set yourself a huge challenge but nobody in your audience actually understands what you're doing maybe it's not worth it so i think that's the first point to start is what is it that you want to say with your show? What kind of do you want to communicate? Who's in your audience? And so on. And that's kind of like the basis from which you can build your setup. So here is an overall diagram of all the building blocks of electronic music performances. It looks really complicated, but it's not. So you can see here, obviously you need some kind of sound source because if you haven't got a sound source, then you haven't got sound. So sound sources can be lots of different things. In electronic music, often you've got synthesizers, of course, and samplers, but also vocals or instruments or things like DJ decks or you know things that play back pre-recorded audio just anything that kind of like makes a sound and that then can go into your mixer and can go into your playback system so in order for the sound sources to actually play their sound they need to be controlled by something and you know in most cases they'll be controlled by you as the performer i've got this really strange guy here who's got one hair and he's playing, I don't know, he could, for example, be playing on a synthesizer live on stage and you've got a quite straightforward setup. But what if he wants to play on five different synths, then things get a little bit more complicated and that's when things like sequencers come in or MIDI controllers. Because what they allow you to do is to control several different things at once. When you have really complex setups, sometimes you need some kind of clock signal to keep everything in time and you might start to need control signal routing tools, so different things that route different signals around your system. 
Uh, lastly, what could happen is that you put some effects on your sound. Uh, so you might have EQ or reverb or compression or anything else like that. And you might apply it to some of your sound sources or all of them. It's completely up to you. Um, so that's all of your sound done. And then in addition, you kind of want to think about what your show looks like. So you might have visual parameters. You might have things like dancing, pyrotechnics. All of those things make up your performance. Some devices combine all of these building blocks into one neat package. For example, laptops, which do it all. Um, but, you know, in other cases, you've got setups where every single building block is kind of like its own electronic device. And then there's everything in between. Like, actually, you can sort of combine any tool with any other tool, as long as you can somehow connect them. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is DAWs and controllers. So if you're an electronic music producer, you've probably come across something like Logic or FL Studio or Bitwig or Ableton or Machine or anything like that. You know, basically a DAW, <laughs> a program in which you can produce music. And you might have also come across a variety of different hardware controllers such as pushers or launch pads or MIDI controllers. And of course you can use these things in order to perform your electronic music life. And this is actually, I think, what most people end up doing. So what's so awesome about setups consisting of a laptop and some controllers is that you've got infinite or almost infinite possibilities. You can add as many plugins, as many sounds and synths, you know, soft synths as you like, uh, you know, can install all this cool stuff and it's just all on your laptop. So it's super portable. It's super flexible. You can share online. You can even jam with other people like by linking different laptops together. Um, for example, Ableton has a link function. Um, so it's just like super flexible and you just can do so, so much with it. Uh, so in a nutshell, what happens is you've got the program that you're using, the DAW, and then you've got some hardware controllers that are controlling things inside of that program. And normally what people do is they'll break down their productions into sort of like clips. It's not called clips in every single software, uh, but in Ableton and Bitwig, we talk about clips. Um, but, you know, all of the other bits of software, they've got some kind of thing that works in the same way. So a clip is like a short little snippet of audio or MIDI. And you can stick all these clips together in order to create an arrangement. Of course, there's lots to it. You've got to make sure that they are in time, that they go together and so on. Uh, but in a nutshell, you have some kind of MIDI controller with buttons and you push the buttons and it plays back the clips and you've got your live arrangement. Then you can also assign effects to MIDI controllers. So you can, for example, say, I want to put a high pass filter on this section. I want some reverb. I want some distortion. Um, some people also are awesome at working with one shots, you know, like uh, basically finger drummers, you know, they play really, really fast on like some pads and they create a rhythm on the fly, which I find really impressive. I wish I was better at that. Um, what else? You know, you can even record yourself live. You can sing to your arrangement. You can loop things that you're doing live. So there's lots of things that you can do. So the tutorial video that I made is a tutorial about Ableton, how I take sort of like a complex logic production and then perform it in Ableton. And I use a launch pad, a tractor control F1, and a Akai MPK Mini MIDI controller, which is, I really struggle to say that for some reason. Uh, and I used all those things to sort of take my productions, which are, which are kind of like fairly linear, static, complicated studio productions, you know, which is totally normal, but break them down into chunks so that I can perform them live. And that's what DAWs and controllers are fantastic for. So there's lots to be said about MIDI controllers. Um, it's a vast world really, uh, and there's lots to it. And there's so many different things that you can get. There's simple controllers that just have like buttons, knobs, faders, and sliders. Uh, then there's a ton of controllers that look like musical instruments. You're most likely familiar with MIDI controllers that look like piano keyboards, you know, like the Akai MPK Mini MIDI controller for example, looks like a piano keyboard. Uh, but that's not where it ends. There's also controllers that look like a bunch of other instruments. For example, there's the Roland V-drums. 
you know, which you can use in order to expand your traditional drum kit with MIDI functionality. You also can use the Roland SPD-SX MIDI controller for drummers. There's a Yamaha MIDI guitar. It's unfortunately discontinued now, but you can use it like an electric guitar and it produces MIDI. Then there's the Livid Guitar Wing, which is a wireless MIDI controller. Uh, there's a Cantini Earphonic Electric Violin that you can use as a violin player to create MIDI data. Any instrument you can play, you'll probably find some kind of exotic and unusual MIDI controller that has the same shape as your instrument and will allow you to jam on it. There's also a bunch of modular controllers, so for example by Jouet, uh, Jouet, I hope I'm saying that right, they basically make these MIDI controllers and they make a bunch of overlays that you can put on the controller, so you can kind of change what your controller does according to your taste. There's also motion control performance controllers, such as the Mimu MIDI gloves, which are gloves that you can wear, uh, and even the Machina MIDI jacket, which is a whole jacket that you can wear and do things with in order to control the sound. There are extra expressive controllers, maybe you know the Rolly Seaboard, which has got squishy keys and it allows you to sort of put vibrato into different notes. So MIDI polyphonic expression or MPE is a whole other topic, uh, which is really interesting, which I'm covering in my book. Uh, and there's lots to be said about it. Uh, then there's MIDI sequencers like the Squawk Pyramid, which allow you to send like pre-designed MIDI notes out into a variety of instruments. But basically the options are endless. If you could imagine any shape or form of controller, it probably exists. The bottom line is you can be really creative and you can make most controllers do whatever you want. So you can make them play notes, you can use them to control effects. Uh, and a whole bunch of other things. Basically, whatever you want to do, you can do with a MIDI controller. <laughs> so I made a tutorial where I used a Squat Pyramid MIDI sequencer and a MIDI keyboard. And I used those things to control a Mook Siren synth, a Vamona drum synth, and uh, even a Game Boy as well. So uh, this is just one example of how you can stick things together in like a creative way. So next up, I want to talk about DJ. You're probably familiar with uh, what DJs are. <laughs> They're basically people that are amazing at two different things. They're great at creating playlists, you know, reading the audience and they just know what the best track is to play next, which is a really tricky skill to achieve. Uh, and they're also very good at blending tracks together. So I guess this thing that sets DJing apart from other types of electronic music performance is, you know, even though there's a lot of overlap, but um, basically you're blending tracks together. You sort of don't have any gaps between tracks. You're just like smushing them together uh, and it takes a lot of skill because you have to be good at beat matching, you know, telling, even though some of these things are automated now in a lot of software, uh, you still have to kind of gauge what keys fit together musically. Also like how you can sort of tell a story for your DJ set, build things on each other and so on. So of course, many DJs expand their sets, setups, so they might have sort of CDJs or Technics or some kind of DJ deck, or they might use Serato or something. But then in addition, they might also throw in like a MIDI controller or hardware effect or kind of anything from any of the other categories that we're discussing here today. Um, and I've been very lucky to have uh, an amazing DJ on board here on my YouTube channel. His name is Dan Murray and he's created sort of like a complete introduction to DJing with three different setups, which I think is really useful. So as I've already mentioned, of course, a lot of pop music is created in a DAW. And of course you've got your instrumental, but you also have vocals. Uh, so oftentimes there'll be someone singing in an electronic music performance, uh, but it doesn't end there. You could have any other instrument added as well. So what's really interesting is there are some artists that have got instruments on their record, but then when they perform live, they sample the instruments. Uh, and then there's other artists that actually don't have instruments on their record, but they invite some musicians to join them on stage to kind of like spice things up and add a bit of interest to their live shows. Uh, so there's plenty of things you can do. Uh, and when it comes to instruments, of course, you've got to pick the right mi microphone or DI box, the right amplifier. You can also work with effects. 
uh, and all those kinds of things. And the tutorial that I created basically makes use of a TC Helicon Voice Life touch processor. Uh, and I was basically performing with Joe, who I'm in a band called Amber with, and Joe is using this processor in order to create life harmonies from his vocals. Uh, and then in addition, he plays on an OB6 synth and I play violin. So I guess that's an example of how you can combine acoustic and electronic instruments. I've got actually quite a few videos here on my channel where I either sing or play violin and I combine that with electronic instruments. So of course, synthesizers and samplers are key ingredients in electronic music. You know, whether it's a soft synth or a hardware synth, uh, you name it, you know, that's what kind of makes electronic music electronic music, right? The whole history of hip hop is really heavily based on samplers uh, and, you know, sampling records and putting them into new records and so on. So it's really an area that you can't ignore if you look at electronic music performance. So of course you can also take synths and samplers with you on stage and they look and sound great and obviously if you're a brilliant keys player or you're great at finger drumming, uh, you can do some really impressive stuff. And you can obviously combine these synths and samplers with all of the other things that we discussed in this video. So for example, you might have a DAW and some MIDI controllers, but you might then also have a synth as well that you're controlling live. So in my book, I'm sort of covering all of the synthesis techniques like additive, subtractive, FM synthesis and so on. And I go through like oscillators and amplifiers, la di da, you know, all of the different controls that you find on the synth. Don't really have time to go through all of that in this video. But I do recommend that you familiarize yourself with sound design and maybe learn a little bit about how synths work and how you can make your own sounds. So what's really awesome is even if you're not a great keys player or you don't really know how to perform live on a keyboard, you can root MIDI into a synth and you can sort of like just perform live with sound design parameters and you can create some really interesting soundscapes and play with timbre basically. So I made a tutorial on my YouTube channel which uses software and hardware synths uh, and in my case, I'm controlling a Rolly Equator 2 soft synth with a Rolly Seaboard. And I'm also feeding some MIDI from Logic into an OB6 synth. One thing that we've not talked about is can you actually perform electronic music with lots of parts and lots of components without a laptop? And the answer is yes, you can. So I remember the diagram I showed you at the beginning. Uh, you can actually buy a separate hardware device for each of those things. So instead of using a laptop, each part of the setup can be its own hardware device, uh, you know, the control signal generator, so you could have uh, some kind of hardware sequencer, you could have, um, you know, some synths, little synths on stage, you could have some effects as hardware effects. For example, I've got a Strymon Big Sky Reverb hardware effect that I use a lot. And each of those things can be a separate building block and you kind of got to plug them all into one another in order to uh, create your music. There's also a couple of all-in-one tools available like the Octatrack or, you know, the Teenage Engineering OP1, OPZ uh, things. You know, those kinds of things are great for like working with hardware but not having lots and lots and lots of separate devices. If you love having lots of separate devices, you can dabble with modular synthesis, which is really fun and also a very steep learning curve. I've got an excellent tutorial by Matt Goodison in said playlist where he breaks down his very own cable spaghetti modular setup, which I find really impressive. So really you can combine loads of things with loads of other things and it allows you to create your own deeply personal performance instrument. And I don't want to say it's more personal than when you use DAWs, but I guess because it's forcing you to really think about what you want to use in your performance and what functionality you need, you kind of end up with something really custom, which a lot of people find really exciting. Next up, we're going to enter even more experimental territory. And it's basically the world of programming your own performance tools. Uh, and I completely understand that most people will be like, nah, no, I'm not going down that rabbit hole because programming is obviously not easy. And, you know, we're musicians, we're not necessarily computer scientists, but still there are artists that create their very own 
performance tools from scratch. Some artists have also worked with software companies, for example, you've got BT, who's made, you know, the stutter edit with, um, together with Isotope. Uh, there's many, many, many examples of this. Uh, so of course it's possible to create a completely new plugin or completely new bit of software from scratch. And there's also a bunch of programming languages specifically for music. Uh, you might have heard of Maximus P, which is a node based programming environment, uh, similarly to pure data. And uh, my colleague Francesc Moya has made a tutorial video in the same playlist which is about how you can create randomly generated electronic music that still sounds in key and sort of use Maximus P to set that up. Another really unique practice that I'm personally super fascinated by is life coding. So essentially you have, it's like the complete antithesis to like physical musicianship. Uh, so you're no longer on the stage jamming, but instead the performer is on the stage typing computer code and it's like so unusual and so crazy and yeah. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, I really recommend Eli Field Steel. He's also made a tutorial video for my channel. Thanks so much, Eli. And uh, he basically shows you how you can use Super Collider, which is a live coding platform uh, to create electronic music from scratch. It's really impressive because you start from a complete blank screen there's nothing to begin with. You have to create all your synths and all your sound sources from scratch through code. Uh, and yes, it is. Uh, if it sounds complicated, that's because it is complicated. But I think it just forces you again to think really critically about what you want to actually do as a musician. And it removes any existing structures and really throws you in the deep end. Uh, so if you're a beginner, you know, performer, maybe that's not the way you want to go, but it's definitely an option if you want to explore it. So we've talked about people that code their own performance tools. Of course, you can also build your own performance hardware, uh, which is equally challenging. And a lot of artists have worked with custom hardware, uh, which has been really, really impressive. Back in the 70s, Kraftwerk built a laser drum cage. Um, you probably know Bjork and her many uh, weird and wonderful instruments. The most impressive one, in my opinion, is the Tesla coil lightning machine. And uh, Matt Robertson, who I was lucky enough to interview for my book, he basically controls this uh, Tesla coil through Ableton, which is really wacky and cool. And um, it makes a viciously loud sound, like it's so loud, like it needs no amplification and it looks really cool as well. So you basically have lightning on the stage, you've got a really loud sound and it's just such a unique thing to do. Some people use EMG, you know, electrical activity in the brain, EEG, eye motion, heart rate, and, you know, sort of bodily responses and translate them into musical data through custom devices. That's a really interesting territory as well. Uh, some people use traditional musical instruments, but build robots in order to perform on them, like Pat Metheny in his orchestrion album. Some people repurpose, you know, um, existing toys and household items. I don't know if you've heard of um, Look Mum No Computer. It's a really funny channel on YouTube called Look Mum No Computer by uh, a guy called Sam Battle. And for example, he's like taken, he's built like this Furby organ where he's used loads and loads of Furbies and he's performing on the Furbies through like a keyboard controller, which is so cool. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to have uh, Dominique Pelletier, also known as Rainbow Trash, and she built like a theremin, a light controlled theremin inside of a Game Boy shell. And she broke that down in a tutorial in my channel as well. So one thing we haven't talked about yet that's also really important is your performance setting. Are you performing at a festival or in a small bar or in a theatre? You know, depending on where you're performing, some things work really well and others not so much. So for example, if you're on a huge festival stage and you're working with a tiny MIDI controller, it might get a little bit lost. Uh, so it really makes sense to think about where is it that you're going to perform and what's gonna work in that setting and what does your audience actually understand? So another awesome tutorial, which was made by Stephen Massey, who's a live sound engineer and a producer. 
uh, he's basically breaking down common lifestyle and technology in the tutorial, looking at PA systems, monitoring, mixing desks, uh, and so on. Uh, breaking down basically a typical large venue playback rig. Of course, you can also do a lot with visual parameters. I've already kind of touched on that. So, you know, you can dance or work with visuals or have like fireworks or any kind of visually cool stuff happening on stage. Uh, so in order to kind of give you an example of that, I created a tutorial video where I used the third party plugin Ebow Suite in order to perform in Ableton Live with visuals. And I'm basically using, or well, I've created these pixely or voxely retro games inspired visuals in order to spice things up a bit, because that's what I like to do as an artist. I like to work with retro games uh, inspired stuff. The last thing that I've got tutorial videos about is like the planning and promoting of a live show. Uh, there's lots to it as well. Basically, as an artist, it's important to be remarkable. You know, there has to be, you've got to have some kind of clear artist identity or like a brand, I guess. Something that's memorable and something that makes people hooked and, you know, want to come back and listen to more of your stuff and so on. And I think that's the most important thing. And then you've got to find your scene, you know, like other people that are into similar things, identify your target audience and so on. So Woody Van Eyden, who's an absolute legend, has made me a five part tutorial series about, you know, the do's and don'ts for artists that want to succeed in the music industry. And he's a really great guy. He's an internationally acclaimed award winning music manager, DJ, trans producer, performer, label owner. And he's worked with uh, ATB and Alex Morph, um, you know, it's actually Alex Morph's manager. And he's really great. So that's definitely worth a watch as well. So I feel like I've probably completely <laughs> blown up everyone's brains. I'm really sorry, but uh, I've tried to summarize my book in a video, which is of course really, really difficult if there's so much to it. Um, but I guess that's the takeaway point from this video. There's no one fits all approach. There's no like you must perform your music in this way. You know, anyone that tells you that there's a specific way in which you should be performing, you know, don't listen to them. Because uh, performance is just as creative as production and any other part of the sort of music creation chain. Uh, so basically some people DJ, some people use MIDI controllers, some people work with visuals, some even create their own tools, software or hardware tools. Some people are on their own, others are in bands and so on. So there's lots of things that you can do. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, I think it's just thinking about what's your concept? What do you want to communicate to your audience? What's like your message? You know, what, what do you want the look and feel of your show to be? And also, what do you find fun? You know, what do you want to learn more about? And you can use these things to sort of like construct your own approach. Uh, so I hope that was useful. Um, please do check out the tutorial series if you want to learn more about all the individual setups. And of course, there's the book if you want to kind of um, delve a little bit deeper as well. Uh, but for now, please feel free to leave any questions below, or any comments, you know, let me know what your setup looks like. You know, if you're stuck and you don't know what to do, I can try and give some advice. Um, but yeah, I hope that was useful. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye. <laughs>